I haven't been given permission to talk yet. <laughs> ah, good morning, everyone. Um, and good morning to everyone on Facebook who's watching at the moment, and good morning to anyone on YouTube who's watching this later. I am not Matt Garvin. Um, sorry about that. He has better hair than me. You're stuck with me today. Matt is on holidays. Um, and throughout the month of January here at Citywide, we are going to be spending the, our Sundays delving into the Psalms. We're going to be having a summer of Psalms. So different members of the community here have been asked to share about their, their favourite Psalms or Psalms that are significant to them. I guess first of all, before I share about my particular Psalm, we need to talk about what, what's a psalm? Uh, we shouldn't take it for granted that everybody understands what that is. So in the Bible there is a, a whole book of psalms. A psalm is uh, essentially the meaning of that word is words that accompany music. So it's like a poem or a song. Uh, in the book of psalms there are about a hundred, no not about, there are a hundred and fifty individual psalms. Uh, they're not all written by the same person and they're not all about the same stuff. So there are pretty much five different kinds of psalms. There's praise psalms, there are psalms about wisdom, there are the royal psalms, there are thanksgiving psalms and there are psalms of lament. And they don't all neatly fall into those categories. Some of them have a bit of, bit of one and a bit of another, but uh, most of them fall into one of those categories. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Psalm 40, which is both a, a lament and a thanksgiving. It actually falls into a subcategory of Psalms that we might call deliverance Psalms. Uh, a psalm about how the writer was delivered from something and it feels very appropriate right now in Australia to be talking about deliverance with uh, what's going on, particularly on the mainland, uh, with the bushfires. I love the book of Psalms. It's one of my favourite books of the Bible. Um, one of my favourite stories of the Bible is the story of David. Most people are familiar at least with the broad strokes of the story of David. He's the guy who killed Goliath with the slingshot. He became the king of Israel. I can remember when I was a kid, I was about eight, my parents bought me this set of comic books. I was really into comic books as a kid. To be honest, I still am really into comic books. I still buy comic books, don't judge me. Um, but my parents gave me this set of, there were six of them, six comics, and it was the entire Bible in comic form. And I loved these books. I took them with me everywhere, literally everywhere. Uh, I have very fond memories of sitting at my dad's feet in church while he was singing some hymn that I didn't understand or know while I was reading my Bible comics. Um, I used them so much they got completely beaten up and unfortunately they fell apart and I don't have them anymore. My favourite one of those comics was the third one which dealt mostly with the kings of Israel and my favourite parts were the parts about David. To me as a kid and even sometimes now but particularly when I was a kid, David was kind of like a superhero. He was really no different to reading a, a, a comic about Batman or Captain America. To me, David was that cool. Um, and, and so I used to read that particular story just over and over and over again. It was my favourite story. Uh, it's interesting though because in that story uh, there comes a point where before David is the king of Israel, the, the the king of Israel before him, Saul, was killed in battle. And so was Saul's son, Jonathan. And there's a little panel in my comic book 
it showed a psalm that David wrote to memorialise King Saul and his friend Jonathan. Unfortunately, I can't remember what the psalm was. I think it was Psalm 28. It was the first time I became aware of the fact that there was this thing called the Book of Psalms because obviously they didn't fit into my comic book. There was no place in a comic book for the Book of Psalms. It wasn't until much later that I realised that along with being a superhero, that David was actually a poet. In fact, he was a really amazing poet. So of the 150 psalms in the book of Psalms, David wrote about half of them. Now, some scholars say he wrote 73. Some scholars say he wrote 75. So we'll just stick with about half. I first really got into the book of Psalms for pretty shallow reasons, if I'm honest about it. Uh, people who uh, at Citywide or people who watch Citywide's videos would know that uh, Matt Garvin is a huge U2 fan and he loves Bono. He often quotes Bono. And I, I, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I too am a huge U2 fan. And one of my biggest heroes is a guy named Bono. And Bono talks about the Psalms a lot. Um, as a young man, I'd read my Bible comic, obviously, and I'd, I had a Bible, I'd read the four Gospels, I'd, I'd read some of Paul's letters. They were confusing. I didn't really understand them very well when I was a teenager. Um, I was fairly familiar with the historical books of the Old Testament, but I'd never really had an encounter with the book of Psalms. Out, except for Psalm 23, of course, which I think everybody knows. Um, people who know me know that I'm really into music. Uh, and I got really into U2 as a teenager. Music is sort of like, it's kind of like a sacrament to me. It almost feels like a sacred thing. Uh, there are a lot of songs that are n not even what you would class classically call a worship song. There are a lot of songs that are really spiritual to me. I, and I actually feel like my whole life has got a soundtrack. I literally feel like I walk around and there's music playing all the time. Um, and probably the most special part of that soundtrack is reserved for the music of U2. So I started to get interested in the Psalms because my, one of my heroes talked about them a lot. When I was about 16, I bought a book which was, uh, it was a really good book. It was, it was about the meanings behind all of you 2s songs. And it was kind of a treasure trove, spiritually for me. I, I realised, as much as I knew some of you 2s songs had had references, like biblical references, I came to realise that most of them did. And they kept talking about the Psalms all the time. And I thought, wow, I better look at those then because they're cool so the psalms must be cool because they're interested in them so that's how I got into the psalms uh, and I, I, in fact I found this great quote of something that Bono once said uh, he said here words and music did for me what solid even rigorous religious argument could never do they introduced me to God not belief in God more an experiential sense of God over art, literature, girls, my mates. The way into my spirit was a combination of words and music. As a result, the book of Psalms always felt open to me and led me to the poetry of Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, the book of John. Now, Bono said that, but I really feel like I, that, that's something I could write as well. One of my favourite U2 songs is a song called 40. Some people might have heard of it. I don't know. We're not going to play it during this video. We're going to hear it after the service. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, I encourage you to do a search later on. Uh, U2, 40. It's a great song. And it's actually a rendi rendition of part of the 40th Psalm. I didn't know that when I was a kid. 
Psalm 40 was one of David's psalms. We, we don't actually know when he wrote it, so we don't know the exact context of the psalm, but it was clearly written during a time of trial or just after a time of trial. Um, he, he various, t- various times in his life, David had people trying to kill him. Uh, he had people hunting him down. He had his own son turn against him and he had to fight a civil war. He had lots of hard times in his life. One of the interesting aspects of the Psalms is that they weren't written in English and they weren't written for people who speak English. So their writing conventions are actually not the same as our writing conventions because Jewish or Hebrew people from that time thought completely differently to the way we do today. And it's really important to keep that in mind Whenever we look at the Bible, it's important to keep in mind what was the context of the person who wrote this. Particularly when we get to things like poetry, it's really important to remember because sometimes we can read the Psalms and they're weird to us because it's like, oh, these are meant to be poems, but they don't rhyme. They're, they're set out in a strange order. I don't get it. So just keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that later. But the, this was not written in English. It's been translated into English. So we're going to take a look at it. The psalm begins with David waiting for and receiving God's help in verses 1 and 2. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. So we we hear there that David was clearly in a lot of trouble and God rescued him from it. But one of the key words in here that I think a lot of people maybe jump over or key phrases, not words, is I waited patiently. It didn't happen straight away. He actually had to wait for help to come. Waiting is actually a central part of the Christian walk. Because if we didn't have to wait, we wouldn't need to have faith. If everything just happened straight away, Lord, please put out those bushfires and it just happened immediately, we wouldn't have to have any faith in our God at all. Faith is actually formed partly through having to wait. And because we have faith and because we know we have a great God who has got our back, we can wait patiently. Part of waiting patiently is having an expectation. So we're able to ask God for help and feel really confident that he is going to come whether it comes right now or in five minutes or in a week or a month or a year. It's going to happen in his time. This idea of waiting is not just in this psalm. It's actually, you'll actually find it in lots of parts of the Bible and you'll actually find it in lots of psalms. Uh, One example uh, I'm going to quote here is Psalm 130. We see the same thing. Uh, The psalmist there says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his words, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. So when we wait, we're not waiting hopelessly. We're waiting for a God who we know has got our backs. What's interesting is the next part of Psalm 40 is uh, thanksgiving. David says here, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. And it's really important when we've had a time when we've relied on God and God has helped us, it's really important that we do have that thanksgiving. 
it's really easy to take it for granted when God does something. Oftentimes when God does something, they see, it seems like small things. We should never take it for granted. Praise and thanksgiving always needs to come after God moves. Next, it's interesting because the, the fourth verse is kind of like a benediction. We're going to talk about what a benediction is in a minute. That's a big word. Some people probably know what it means. Other people probably don't. But David says here, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. What's a benediction? A benediction comes from the Latin. It means good words. Often when you go to a church service or a, or a religious service, a benediction will come at the end. Uh, the, the priest or the, the pastor will give his sermon and then he'll give a benediction over the people listening. So it's really interesting that uh, the benediction here, it's not at the end, is it? It's, it's in the middle. We've still got 13 more verses to go. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the middle. We have a tradition here at Citywide. We, we, uh, we send each other out every week with a benediction and we're going to do that later. Benedictions are important because, like uh, the meaning, they're, they're leaving one another with good words. Sending one another out well. Again, this is part of that writing structure. It feels like an ending, but it's kind of here in the middle. Then David goes on to talk about God's goodness and wonders. He says, Many, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. And I actually, this verse casts my mind back to verse 3 where David said that God had put a new song on his tongue and this sounds like that new song doesn't it many lord are your wonders that you have done none can compare with you if i were to speak of your deeds there would be too many to declare it's like a song of praise a new song of joy and happiness but then the psalm kind of changes a lot and we get this Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your, living act, your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. There's this idea here that God says that you didn't want sacrifices. But then David says that your laws have been written on my heart. That's an idea that the Bible comes back to again and again, people's hearts being changed. We get another example of it in Jeremiah 31. Where it says here, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is actually a central idea to Jesus' teaching. It's probably best expressed, I think, in the Sermon on the, on the Mount. We've spent a lot of time this year in the Sermon on the Mount at Citywide. What, nearly all year? Um, one of the things that we spent a few weeks on was the Lord's Prayer. And that has in here, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will can't be done on earth as it is in heaven by us unless his law is written on our hearts. 
We can't live up to that unless our hearts have been changed. It's the only way. David spells it out for us. Jesus doesn't want us to make sacrifices to him in order to repair our relationship with him. He wants us to change. He wants us to have new hearts. Now David goes on to ask for God's mercy. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. And then he goes on to describe his troubles. For, the, for troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs on my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, Aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, The Lord is great. I don't know about you, but that list of David's troubles I can really relate to. Being surrounded by troubles. Do you ever feel like you're surrounded by troubles? I do. Not being able to see things clearly. Do you ever feel like you can't see clearly? I, I sure feel that way a lot. Feeling like there are people working against you. Do you ever feel like there are people working against you? I've certainly had that feeling before. It's not nice. I mean, David had people trying to kill him on more than one occasion. I can't relate to that, but uh, I certainly know how it feels to feel like people have not got your best interests in, at heart. So these are really relatable things. Remember what I said earlier about the writing conventions of the Psalms. This is where we're going to talk about that stuff. The structure of this psalm is really interesting. It starts off with a reflection on what God did. Then we have thanksgiving. Then we have a benediction. Then we have an expression of gratitude towards God. And then we have a prayer for deliverance. Like I said earlier, Hebrew poetry and writing conventions of that time, and I'm sure even now today, were very different to 21st century English writing conventions. It's, that is really different. That structure is really different to the way we think about poetry and prayer today. I think it's fair to say that if this psalm had been written by an Australian in 2020, it wouldn't be structured like that. I'd, I'm not going to posit exactly how it would be structured, but it would probably be something like gratitude and love, then the prayer for deliverance, then the reflection on what God did, then the praise, then the benediction. It's a completely different way of thinking about it. So it's just important to keep in mind if we find these psalms hard to read sometimes, these people didn't always think the way we do. The biggest takeaway I have from this psalm is, like I said, God doesn't want us to be making sacrifices or trying to atone for our sins because we can never actually do that. I can never, ever sacrifice enough to get myself right with God. I can't. So it's really great that he doesn't require that of me because if he did, I'd be in lots of trouble. No, he wants us to be changed. He wants us to have new hearts. David was the king of Israel. But not only was he the king of Israel, he was a direct ancestor to Jesus. Jesus is actually... 
of the same royal line as David. That's that great genealogy you get in the book of Matthew at the start that most people skip over. That's the proof. That's, that's Matthew's proof that uh, Jesus is of that line. So David was an earthly king. But here we have an earthly king diagnosing the problem with the hearts of people. The fact that we can't save ourselves. Even if we're the president or a king or the prime minister, we can't. We can't rescue ourselves. We can't save ourselves. So from David's family line, this worldly king, we get a heavenly king. And Jesus offers us a way to free ourselves from that cycle of atonement, that, that endless treadmill of sacrifice, stuffing up, having to sacrifice again, stuffing up again. Jesus actually offers us a way to get out of that cycle if we're able to you know, accept what he's offering. Again, I'm going to go back, go back to Bono. He's a much more eloquent speaker than I am. This is what Bono had to say about the 40th Psalm. Psalm 40 is interesting in that it suggests a time in which grace will replace karma and love will replace the very strict laws of Moses. In other words, fulfill them. I love that thought. David, who committed some of the most selfish as well as selfless acts, was depending on it. That the scriptures are brimful of hustlers, murderers, cowards, adulterers and mercenaries used to shock me. Now it's a source of great comfort. I don't know about you, but I can really, really relate to that. The cross of Jesus offers us an opportunity to have our hearts change forever. Uh, just like a, 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 a computer drive getting written over. To have something written on our hearts, to have a new thing written on our hearts, to have new hearts. Just like David, when Jesus rescues us from our pit and our slime and our mire, we need to praise him as well. And that's what we do on a Sunday when we come together, we sing songs, we praise him. This is why we do this. We have a new song of joy, just like David did. In the psalm, David offered his life in obedience to God, and that's the only way. It's the only way. It's a, it's a thing that uh, Matt Garvin has uh, quoted many times. I think he quoted it last week, in fact. Uh, Jesus said, if you seek your life, going to lose it but if you give up your life to follow me you'll find it it's the only way so I just wanted to close with some listening prayer so um, and I have a terrible memory so I wrote it down so let's, let's come to a time of prayer um, Jesus, can you show us the areas of our lives where we're not offering ourselves up to you? Just show us that, Lord, now as we sit in this quiet time. Where in our lives are we not offering ourselves up to you? And Jesus, can you show us the areas in our lives where we need to wait? We need, the times where we need to wait patiently for you to move. Can you show us those times, Lord? Show us where we need to wait.
so Jesus, we um, yeah, we just want to want to praise you with a song of joy for the rescue that you've done for us. You rescued us all from our pits of mud and mire. And Lord, every day, some of us, most of us, you're rescuing from a pit of mud and mire in some form. And Lord, we just want to thank you for that. And Lord, we want to pray that, uh, that you will help us to have new hearts. Help us to give ourselves over to you, Lord, so that we can have your laws written on our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.